Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello and good morning from the West Coast. Welcome to this morning's program, which is uh, features Jonathan Roch and his book In Defense of Truth. My name is Bruce Kane, and I am the Spence and Cleona Eccles Family Director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West at Stanford University. I'm so pleased to be returning to the Commonwealth Club this morning with a distinguished writer and thinker who is the author, I think, of one of the more important and timely books of this year, called The Constitution of Knowledge, The Defense of Truth. Jonathan's book examines how the concept of objective truth is under assault from both sides of the ideological spectrum, left and right, and puts forth ideas about what we all must do to defend ourselves and our society from this attack. Jonathan is currently a senior fellow of Governance Studies program at the Brookings Institute in Washington. So we welcome you, Jonathan, to the Con uh, to the Commonwealth Club. It's good to see you again. I was a colleague of yours at the Brookings Institute for a short period of time, and have been an admirer of your work for some time. Now today's format is going to consist of an introductory talk by Jonathan, followed by a question and answers session that will be led by me. We encourage you to put your questions into the YouTube chat feature, and I will try to get as many of them as I can. Uh, put in front of uh, Jonathan to answer questions. Ask their, um, you know, uh, uh, out, uh, I may have to aggregate some of them into a common question. So if we don't ask it exactly the way you have phrased it, understand that we're trying to get as many people's queries in as possible. Okay, so let's jump in, Jonathan. Well, thank you, Bruce. Uh, thanks to the Commonwealth Club. I'm I'm thrilled to be here today with this book. And and Bruce, uh, I've learned so much from your work on the politics of politics over the years that I'm um, today, we're talking about something a little different, which is the politics of truth, the politics of knowledge. But in many ways they're related. That's the case I'm about to make. I'll talk for about, I don't know, 12, 15 minutes and um, show you, show you a few images along the way, but I thought I'd give you a few of the highlights here and what I think I'm up to. Motivating question is a lot of people have said that there's an epistemic crisis going on right now. Everyone from former FBI director James Comey to Barack Obama just this past November. What is that exactly? What's it doing to us? What are the effects, the causes, and how do we deal with it? This is what I think an epistemic crisis is, a um, breakdown or disruption of a society's epistemic constitution, by which I mean its social system for settling differences of belief and building a shared public reality. This is something that's very hard to do. Historically, through 200,000 years of human history, we've normally settled differences of opinion through exile, ostracism, oppression, imprisonment, out-and-out uh, -out execution. Societies divide into sects, they go to war, they go down epistemic rabbit holes, cling to false beliefs for, for far too long. We haven't done that. I'm about to explain why. But we are seeing what I think are the symptoms of an epistemic crisis in America. Those are things like polarization, chilling of opinion, false consensus, forking realities, which can lead ultimately to ungovernability and even civil war. One symptom of that right now, as I think most people in this event are aware, 75% of Republicans believe that the election was stolen from Donald Trump. Um, and that is, of course, false. This is a new development in American democracy. We've never seen anything quite like that. And this is a poll that came out just yesterday from Morning Consult. People were asked, who is very or somewhat responsible for the attacks that led to the January 16th Capitol attack? On the left here, you see all voters. And as you can see, 61% of them blame Trump as very or somewhat responsible. On the right side, you see Republican voters, very different picture. 30% of them blame Trump. 41% think that Joe Biden was responsible. 
and 52 percent think Democrats in Congress are responsible. That's what I mean by forking realities. And it's a dangerous situation for a democracy. My book tries to put across three big ideas, and I'll move through them very quickly here. But enough, I hope at least to give a sense of things. The first is it's not just a marketplace of ideas. It's a constitution of knowledge. It's a whole system. Second, you're being manipulated. You need to understand how. And the third, they're not 10 feet tall. We are. So start with the the marketplace of ideas. It's a wonderful concept. I love it. I use it all the time, but it's inadequate. And here's why. Humans are bad at sorting out our biases, correcting our errors. We believe what makes sense for us to believe in terms of our identity, our social status, what gives us pleasure. We even perceive what helps our status. The result of that is if you just leave it to people in an unmediated marketplace, you get this hate speech, propaganda, ignorance, and so forth. And this is, this is a well-known fact. You need more than just sort of open exchange. You need structure. You need this guy. Of course, this is James Madison, uh, the leading architect of the U.S. Constitution. It turns out that most of the same principles that make the U.S. Constitution work to create a democratic republic that survived, what, 250 years and now has 10 times the population, uh, sorry, 100 times the population of Madison's day, you need a lot of structure, you need institutions, you need norms, you need incentives for people to behave in pro-social ways, you know, stuff like if you lose the election, you're willing to live with that. Well, the same thing is true in the realm of knowledge. Around the same time as Madison, we set up a regime to settle our differences of opinion, figure out what's true. Um, Most of the the first half of the book is all about that. This is not just an analogy, not just a metaphor. The Constitution of Knowledge is not written down like the U.S. Constitution. It has rules that do a lot of the same things, checks and balances, forces compromise, distributes authority. Uh, uses impersonal rules instead of personal rulers, builds institutions that regulate behavior and prevent chaos. And the result of that's what I call the reality-based community. We're part of that today doing this session. Bruce Kane is part of that at Stanford. I'm part of it at Brookings. Reality-based community is a global network of people and institutions who use impersonal rules to hunt for error. We're talking here big for our science and research and academia. That's number one. Number two, journalism. Number three, government. That's everything from statistical agencies to administrative law courts. And finally, number four, the law itself. The concept of a fact originated in law and jurisprudence is all about finding facts in adversarial ways, showing work. These are the things that keep us as a society anchored to truth, tethered to reality. They keep us out of constant warfare with each other or going down the route of, of Jonestown Uh, where we split off into separate realities. There are a lot of advantages to the constitutional knowledge. This may be the one that strikes the closest to home for me right now. That's my husband, Michael. He's getting vaccinated against COVID a couple months ago. This is the knowledge, the objective knowledge that is protecting me from COVID right now. Objective knowledge is the result of the constitution of knowledge. It fills our libraries, our databases. If all humans died out, Aliens could come to this planet, reconstitute it all, and use all that knowledge. It exists independently of us. This is a transformative technology for humans because it allows us to make knowledge, build on that knowledge, accumulate it, bequeath it. That's what's made our our ability to transcend our small tribes. Point number two. So what's going on today? You're being manipulated. You know, you hear a lot of people say they talk about polarization and cynicism and hostility toward institutions. And they say, woe is us. Where did we go wrong? Is it stagnant working class white wages? Is it the decline of religion? Is it the decline of unions? Uh, Is it Vietnam and Watergate and inflation and, and the 2008 crash? Well, I want to focus on something else. Those are all conversations we have. But I want to focus you on information warfare. That's propaganda and disinformation that organizes and manipulates the social and media environment for political advantage. The goals of doing this to dominate, divide, disorient, and demoralize the target population. The methods are to weaponize cognitive and social vulnerabilities, for example, our tendency 
uh, to rise to our defense when we're outraged or insulted or our tendency to find explanations when things go against us, even if they're wrong, our tendency to use social coercion to silence people we don't like, our ability to get confused if we're swamped with too much information. All of these can be weaponized, used against the Constitution of Knowledge. <clears throat> they all are being weaponized. I'm going to just focus because I think it's the most important one right now on a single aspect of this. There are many more in the book and they're all important. I'm going to talk about disinformation and a specific type of disinformation or class of disinformation. Um, this is Stephen Bannon. He was an advisor to Trump. He worked in the administration for a while. His famous quotation here, the real opposition is the media and the way to deal with them is to flood the zone with shit. flood the zone with well, that doesn't sound very sophisticated, but it turns out it's a propaganda technique that was perfected by the Russians. It's called the fire hose of falsehood. Now, time is precious, but it's still worth spending a minute to listen to a Soviet KGB senior defector explain how this works. I think you'll find it chilling. But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process, which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne мероприятия in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community and their country. Uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures. It's pretty chilling stuff. It's very psychologically sophisticated. It works. This is the Russians using it in 2018 when they sent operatives to poison a defector in the UK. Uh, they had explanations for that. In fact, they had a lot of them. Britain poisoned him. Ukraine poisoned him. It was an accident. Suicide. Revenge. Not a nerve agent. Nerve agent. Russia didn't produce the nerve agent. A different nerve agent. They fling up swarms of falsehoods, concocted theories, red herrings intended not so much to persuade people as to bewilder them. This creates cynicism, mistrust. People don't know what to believe. They become open to demagoguery, cynicism, polarization. It's good stuff or maybe bad stuff. Well, who else does that? This is 2016 political campaign. The numbers are the same if you go through the end of the campaign. According to PolitiFact, 26%, about a quarter of what Hillary Clinton said was mostly or entirely false. That's too high. But that meant most of what she said was true. The equivalent figure for Donald Trump, 71% at least mostly false. If the man was opening his mouth, he was probably telling you something that was entirely or mostly false. Why would he do that? Some kind of weird psychopathy, some just sort of craziness? No, I don't think so. This is his presidency. We've never seen anything like this outpouring of false or misleading claims, over 30,000 over the course of his presidency. And look at the run up before November of 2021. That's the Stop the Steal campaign. That's the unleashing of a, misinf of a disinformation campaign on a scale we've never imagined before in the United States. It starts in April of 2020 with the attack on mail-in voting, which is irrational from the point of view of maximizing Republican votes, since lots of senior Republicans vote by mail. But very rationally, if your real goal is post-election to inflect the media, media environment because you expect to lose, this is Donald Trump's Twitter account. I just picked a random day. This is December 10th. These are seven tweets. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, seven tweets. The election is a fraud. Doesn't end with Donald Trump. This, this is my hometown of Arizona, the Veterans Memorial Coliseum, where I sat and saw many Suns games as a kid. That is a so-called audit of the vote going on. It's not only unnecessary, 
It's being done by an unqualified firm called Cyber Ninjas, which has whose president has avowed that the election was stolen using unorthodox methods. It's pure propaganda theater. And as you can see from the headline here, the goal here is to spread a conspiracy theory and use this as theater to do that. And it's working. Republican officials are making pilgrimage to figure out how they can replicate this in their own state. This is very sophisticated stuff, right? And it's never been deployed in America. We are in an epidemiological sense, a naive population, meaning that we don't have any antibodies against this kind of warfare. That's how we get to 75% of Republicans believing the election was stolen. And notice in this kind of information warfare, you don't have to convince everybody that something that's false is actually true. You're happy if you just confuse them. And it turns out that 40% of independents also are unsure who won the election. They say, well, we don't really know because they've heard so much of this stuff. The deliverables of this kind of campaign are cynicism, like the woman who says there's no real news sources anymore, I don't trust anything, demoralization. I guess I would have to say that I'm completely confused as to who is lying and who is telling the truth. I just feel helpless. If you make people feel helpless, if you demoralize them, you demobilize them. They cannot work against you. You can dominate them. Confusion. I don't know, nor do you, nor do any of us. That's a U.S. center on whether Russia or the Ukraine hacked the DNC servers. We do know it was Russia. It was not Ukraine. Deception. Out and out deception. This is a U.S. Senate candidate a few months ago. We don't know the outcome of the 2020 election. Well, that is just false. There's lots of other areas in the book that are covered. One is cancel campaigns, which are another form of information warfare, but used predominantly these days on the left rather than the right. There's others. There's trolling. There's the role of digital media, social media, and accelerating all these trends. But I want to leave you just briefly by mentioning a third conclusion, which we'll mostly talk about, I think, in the conversation. But it's this. Right now, it feels like we are just overwhelmed with all this stuff. Like, we don't know how we'll ever get social media under control. We don't know what to do about disinformation. Canceling seems to have taken universities by storm and increasingly has moved into newsrooms and even corporate HR departments. Here's the thing. The constitution of knowledge is different from a marketplace of ideas because it's not self-maintaining. We need to maintain it. We need to understand it. If we shore it up, if we strengthen it, we're 10 feet tall. Not they are. That's a big if. But I'm hopeful. Got a long way to go, but there are a lot of measures that we can take. I've listed some of them here. I won't try to go through them all, but, but and a lot of these are already beginning to happen. And it's important to remember that only the Constitution of Knowledge can build all of that data that's in all of those libraries, all of that information, create an entire global society of knowledge seekers who never, ever go to war in order to settle disagreements. This is a revolution in human affairs. And one other thing to remember, there's only one system that can do this. So thank you. Over to Bruce. And Oh, very good, uh, Jonathan. That is, uh, I guess, a little bit chilling to think about uh, not only the foreign manipulation, but the internal manipulation. So we get into that. But I think because some of the reviews have focused on something that you didn't talk as much about, to be fair to the viewers and to give them uh, what we suggested, which is that you worry about this problem, not just on the right, which is very obvious to a Bay Area audience. You don't have to convince them. But uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your chapters on canceling and uh, the same kinds of problems that you see on the left. Let's be fair and and see the whole spectrum of it. I'm I'm for it. Should I should I just dive in with a quick synopsis? Dive right in and tell us. I think I think to be fair, why don't you just describe that? Because they're very interesting chapters. And for those of us who teach on a regular basis, it's something that we have to think about and grapple with. So, yeah. Why don't you describe that part of the book just briefly? Yeah. If there's one new idea in this book that I'd like to leave people with, apart from the idea of the Constitution of Knowledge, that we have one. It's something that we're not used to really thinking about, which is. What I just described, Russian style disinformation and propaganda, is very different in terms of its methods and who's using it and what ideologies it's attached to at the moment from what we call cancel culture, a term that didn't exist when I started the book. But they are both, in fact, forms of information warfare. That is, they attempt to organize and manipulate the social and media environments for political gain. 
Mm-hmm. So cancel culture does it differently. Before that term came along, I called it social coercion or coerced conformity. So here's the idea. You can do an experiment. You put eight people in a room, you give them a simple test that says it's just the answer is obvious. You ask them which of three lines on the right matches the same length as the line on the left. You make it blindingly obvious so that it's impossible to get it wrong. Put eight people in that room, but there's a catch. One is the experimental subject. The other seven are actors. The right answer is B, and it's obvious. And when people are left to their own devices, they always get it right. But in that room, at that time, seven of those people will say C. They create a false consensus in the room. What does the eighth person, the actual subject, do? A third of the time, they actually go with the wrong answer. They go with the group answer whether because they want to conform socially, whether because they really think they might be wrong, maybe this is an obstacle, op- optical illusion and I'm not getting it. Maybe they have genuine doubt. A third of people, um, a third of participants do that at, um, and uh, in 75% of the time, a person will do it in at least one trial, in multiple trials. So now flash forward to the present. Suppose you've got a community like a university Suppose a group, a small group, a faction, you know, maybe 20% of the university or 10% or whatever. Suppose they are very motivated activists who want to impose a point of view, manipulate the environment for political advantage, intimidate, silence their opponents. Well, you can weaponize social media. You can weaponize course evaluations against professors. You can use rules against harassment to launch investigations. You can just use denunciations of people as racist so that people who hold certain points of view or want to ask certain points of questions will feel very reluctant to do that. It becomes very risky to go anywhere near these topics. They become chilled. And indeed, polls now find that two thirds of unity university students say that they avoid expressing their real political views for fear of social consequences. I've talked to many professors. They're quoted in the book, including, by the way, many, many progressive professors who say they don't feel safe. Um, teaching the way they want to teach. They're worried about social consequences, investigations. So this has two results. One is the obvious result, which is you can shut down the people that you don't want to be heard. But the second result is you're actually playing with people's minds, right? Because you're creating a false consensus. It looks like everyone on campus believes, for example, um, well, take your proposition. We won't get into it. Everyone believes that. Anyone who doesn't believe that is isolated, shameful, stigmatized. That plays with our brains. That makes us think we're in doubt. We're ashamed of ourselves. We must be wrong. So that can go on in a university environment. Then it turns out social media makes that quite easy to organize and do in a public environment. So now we see cases again and again of social media campaigns being used to isolate, shame people, go after their employers. People are now fired um, if they become controversial on social media, demolish people's reputations if they're called racist. So that's what comes up on Google. Secondary boycotts, big part of that. That's where you go after their friends, their professional associates. They say, Bruce Kane, how can you associate with Jonathan Rash? You know, he's a racist, right? So now you're going to have to denounce me. You're going to feel intimidated. You'll be drawn into the same denial of reality. So that worked in the Soviet Union, although they use cruder methods for the most part. They just, you know, sent you to Siberia. But this can allow a minority meaning a numerical minority, to sustain a false consensus and impose its alternative vision on reality on a society really for quite a long time. We now see that happening nationally. 60% of Americans say that they're reluctant to state their true political views for fear of social consequence. A third of Americans say they're worried if they state their true political views that they will lose a job or job opportunities. And that, by the way, Bruce, this is a new and important development that is now just as true of progressives as it is of conservatives. So, Houston, we have a problem. So do you see this as primarily a kind of problem of a new technology of communication and combined with some sort of culture of uh, going public? It just seems people want to go public with their views a lot more. And in other words, is it possible that there was always this danger, but it's just the fact that, A, so many people are now easily uh, part of the public dialogue that they're confronting what normal political figures always had to confront uh, in terms of castigation, et cetera. Yeah, that, that's, that's such an important question. There's a bunch of historical material in the book, but it's it's a perfect storm. It's new technology 
um, new ideologies, and above all, new actors. So we know cancel culture is ancient. Um, we saw it in the Salem witch trials. We saw it in 1835, Alexis de Tocqueville, that's a name you'll recognize, came to America and says the biggest threat to freedom in America is not from the government. It's from what we now call canceling. If you get on the wrong side of a received opinion, you can lose your livelihood, your friends. So you'll submit. You'll just be quiet. In 1859, John Stuart Mill says exactly the same thing as the case in, in Victorian England. Um, the disinformation tactics, the fire hose of falsehood. That dates over a century. Um, Hitler and Goebbels used that. Lenin used that. So why do we have this new problem in America right now? Number one, we have the technology we, we've talked about, which have made it trivially easy to spread disinformation, to target disinformation, uses, uses bots to do that. You can test disinformation in seconds. You put it out there, you see what spreads virally. Bots automatically are programmed to amplify that. You can exploit vulnerabilities in social media. You know, it used to be very hard to do this. A KGB agent would have to plant documents on like a, a shipwreck in order to make them seem authentic. Well, you know, now you just claim to have found stuff on Hunter Biden's hard drive and you send it through social media. <laughs> so you got technology. You have ideologies, which is, for example, emotional safetyism, which is useful for cancelers because it says if um, that emotional damage a.k.a. offendedness is equivalent to physical damage, and that's a violation of my rights. So that's useful on college campuses to suppress alternate viewpoints. And then the, I think the most important, I know this sounds partisan. I'm not a partisan person. I'm center right. I've voted for and supported many Republicans. I just think this is the truth, the facts right now. You have new actors. You've got trolls on social media. That's anti-vaxxers. It was Gamergate. Um, new publications. You've got conservative media, which is in many ways in its own epistemic environment. Most important, you have Donald J. Trump. Um, Bruce, we have never seen a situation before when a presidential candidate and then a president with all the, uh, the capabilities of his office and his genius, he is a disinformation genius. He's the best since the 1930s, plus conservative media, plus the Republican Party have all been used as an institutional organ of disinformation and propaganda. We have just simply never had to deal with that in America before. It is it is new. When you add those three things together, yeah, you get a complicated and and worrisome situation. Well, actually, your answer uh, touches on a question that one of the viewers brought up, which is the role of the Republican Party. So let me pull it out a little bit on this question. Uh, he wants to know what role the parties had. So let's explore this for a second uh, and ask the question that often gets asked uh, in Washington. Is it more the Democrats or is it more the Republicans? Uh, you could say that it's it's uh, based on what your comments, that it seems like you believe that it's the Republican Party is is more, uh, should we say, dedicated to this task of disinformation. But if you look at the history of sort of political consulting, 20 years ago, you and I were, you know, talking about terms like truthiness and spins. And that is, to what extent uh, do political consultants take facts and spin the interpretation in a direction that sort of leaves things out? It doesn't lie, but it leaves things out. So is there a pathway in terms of the sort of win now mentality on both parties to the kind of disinformation you're talking about, or and if we crossed a line that's different from the line that we maybe had 20 or 30 years ago, in your view? Well, again, this will sound partisan. I think it's just the case. We haven't crossed the line. The Republican Party has crossed the line. The Democrats have not. Uh, they could, you know, if history were different, they might have just as well done what Trump did. These tactics are available and anyone can pick them up. They're not ideological. These are just tools. They're just weapons. I'll, Leninists use them, communists, Nazis use them, fascists. Um, you can use them in all kinds of ways, but no, the Democrats have not, uh, whether because of opportunity or motive or just because the structure of their party is different, they have not, nor in the past have Republicans ever done anything like, for example, the Stop the Steal campaign, a, a massive effort by the party, by conservative media, by the Republican base, and above all, by Donald J. Trump to push out all kinds of falsehoods, conspiracy theories, half-truths, exaggerations through every available media channel, 
as well as through political channels, as well as through the courts. That's what those frivolous lawsuits about. They weren't going to win. But if you can push dozens of them out there and then they get rejected, you can say, see, we know the truth, but the establishment is covering it up. That's that's a tactic called conspiracy bootstrapping. So, no, we have never seen that. Uh, we, we have seen ordinary political spin, ordinary political lies. That's as old as the hills. What I try to communicate is that what's happening now, Russian style disinformation, mass scale fire hose of falsehood tactics, conspiracy, bootstrapping, trolling out of the Oval Office. Um, that's never been tried in America. So let me dive a little deeper into some of the core ideas of this sort of constitution of knowledge. A lot of your examples are about facts and how we come to understand facts in science, in journalism, in law, et cetera. But when we're talking about the political realm, uh, we're not just talking about facts, we're talking about interpretation and we're talking about values. And you can tell a pretty good story about how we determine facts in chemistry and physics or even in reporting in terms of what actually happened. But when we go to try to understand why it happened or, you know, what it means, inevitably sort of subjective judgment come in. So does the constitution of knowledge, do you feel like we've made as much progress uh, in sort of the realm of politics and policy uh, in terms of finding ways to establish truth? Or is it impossible when it comes to political behavior to talk about truth because it necessarily means that you have this subjective component that that really all we can hope for is agreement or agreement to disagree, but we can't really find truth. I mean, I, I, I'm just wondering whether the knowledge component you have is largely about facts and determining facts, which is important because of all the manipulation you're talking about. But in terms of the finding consensus, don't we have to go further and figure out how to get agreement when our values are different? So here's something my book says that others, um, the, some philosophers will not agree with, uh, but which I think is, is the case. Um, I'm going to reframe your question a little bit, Bruce, and say, can political science ever be as crisp an empirical science as chemistry? Or can morality ever be as crisp a discipline as political science? And the answer is that there's a sliding scale and that some kinds of questions are very amenable to being settled empirically, which is to say by different observers looking at different things, applying different tests and coming to some kind of consensus over time. Um, and that's right. Moral questions. When does a human life begin? Um, is one close to my heart? Is homosexual love in some way inferior to heterosexual love? You know, uh, these questions are not going to be settled in a lab, but OK, so here's my claim. The constitution of knowledge cannot resolve every kind of disagreement. In fact, on any given day, it can't resolve most of them. It does resolve some. That's a big deal. But on any given day, the constitution of knowledge can organize the conversation, the public conversation about a disagreement in a way that's most likely to be peaceful and productive. So one way to talk about abortion is just to scream at each other, you know, have have competing protest lines yelling at each other from across the sidewalk in front of the abortion clinic. Another way is to have a conversation where we disagree, but I say, well, here's my reason for thinking life begins at birth, if that's what I think. Look at the heartbeat, look at the sonogram, look at what Aristotle has to say about human life, look at the Christian tradition. You marshal factual arguments and moral arguments and values arguments on the other side, and then we do what the Constitution of Knowledge does. We present those to the larger network of a reality-based observer. And they go to work on it. They say, well, is Bruce right about this? Is John right about that? What are the implications of that? What other ideas do we bring? And it does turn out that over time on moral questions like slavery, a classic example, mm -hmm. the constitution of knowledge does a pretty good job of guiding the conversation in ways that are actually more pro-human, more grounded in reality. I'm a beneficiary of that. I am, I am married to the man whose picture you saw a few minutes ago. The world I grew up in, gay marriage was inconceivable. I mean, it, would, it, was, it was laughable. It was unthinkable. That's because of a structured conversation that people like me were involved in, making our case, making claims, saying we're strengthening marriage, not weakening it. And here's what happened in Massachusetts. Um, and over time, making headway. And by God, we were right. And by God, eventually, people came around. Yeah. 
Well, that's an, that's a good story, but uh, sometimes I get very discouraged, Jonathan, about the story with respect to race. I guess I sort of was one of those people that thought we had made a lot of progress, and I think we have made some progress. But then you see what's happened recently in terms of racial polarization, and you wonder whether the Constitution of Knowledge is working very well in that. Why do you think we succeeded with respect to gay rights, but we have seemed to fallen back into controversies that I guess I naively thought we had made progress on, you know, uh, several decades ago. Well, we're not done on sexual minorities, of course, because uh, there's issues about transgender. And my transgender friends will tell you that their life is not easy. And there's some very thorny debates there that are happening about the medicine of it and what to do about kids and what to do about sports and what is fairness. So this is like peeling an onion. And, you know, race is, is so freighted and so complicated. Um, but I see what's happening now as, as an advance for the constitutional knowledge, at least if we do it right. And here's what I mean by that. Um, you're a scientist by training, a political scientist, but you know, as you understand, every so often, you know, science thinks it's got a, a conclusion that can't be questioned. And then someone brings something new to the table, a new way of thinking about it, new evidence. Uh, sometimes it's so big, people call it a paradigm shift. Um, Every generation will bring new evidence. And another thing about the Constitution of Knowledge is it keeps expanding the community that it works with. It used to be basically a small subset of very privileged, educated white males. The biggest development in science right now is the onboarding of millions of first-rate minds in developing countries, in places like Africa, which are now joining the system and bringing their own perspectives. Uh, Gay people have come in and and are questioning some fundamentals about sexual research. So that's a natural part of the process. And I see these new questions that are coming up as vital questions that in some ways, you know, if if most of the people having the conversation are white or privileged or whatever, you know, that doesn't mean they're getting the wrong answer or that they're racist, but it might mean that there are questions that they're forgetting to ask, assumptions that they're taking for granted. I'm happy to see this challenge. I just think it's very important they be challenged in the right way. Cancel culture should not be part of anti-racism. Anti-racism should be debated like any other point of view. You should be able to disagree without losing your friends or your job. And if we get that right, then I think we're, we're in store for another big spurt of learning about what racism is and what defines it, what drives it, and how to deal with it, if we get it right. Oh, I hope you're right. Uh, so let's go to some of the questions that have been put in. Uh, and actually, this one, uh, we'll start with this one. It says, uh, what might be the motivation for disinformation campaigners like Steve Bannon? What does he gain within the Trump organization, especially since he's not really in it uh, these days? Uh, but what does he gain and um, what's he doing? Is it, is it I can do this because I can do this and it's fun? What, what exactly is the motivation he wants to know? Well, that's a rich and complicated question. Uh, There is actually evidence called the need for chaos, finding that about 20 to 25 percent of people actually have an instinctive thirst for chaos. They like nihilism. They like tearing things down, kind of social vandalism. They think that's fun. And we do see that in trolling behaviors. We saw it in Gamergate. We see it in people who engage in harassment for the sheer what they call lulls of it. But no, That's not most of what Steve Bannon is doing. He's doing a couple of things. Now, he, I'm going to generalize people, let's say people like that, Bannonites, Trumpites. So first thing is they're making money off it, right? Because a great way to sell a media product is by being outrageous um, and finding out what your audience wants to hear, giving them more of it, even if it's false. Second, there is a big political advantage. This is why Vladimir Putin does it. Suppose you want to keep power and suppose the facts are not amenable to your doing so. Like, for example, suppose you're a kleptocrat who's, you know, stealing probably, I don't know, what, one or two percent of the GDP of Russia. Well, what you want to do is make people cynical and doubtful about those facts or any other facts. So they won't know who to trust. And that makes it easier for you to manipulate the system and be demagogic, create cynicism, mistrust. Uh, and capture the narrative, the story for yourself. If you're Putin, you can say, well, I'm not corrupt. You're corrupt. Um, Everyone's corrupt. No one's corrupt. Who knows? We'll never really know. This paves the way for demagogues. 
the slogan here that I like to keep in mind is remember that the ultimate target of most disinformation campaigns is to demoralize the other side, the people who politically you want to dominate by making them feel helpless, cynical, isolated, just plain wrong, doubtful. Well, if you can succeed in doing that, Demoral, uh, demoralization is demobilization. They'll stay home. They'll stop fighting you. Um, and that's what you want if you're a demagogue. And that's what you want if you're an American leader who wants to create a cult of personality around himself and who wants as few questions as possible asked about, um, about his domination of a political party. So we got a couple of questions as to origins of some of the disinformation. So one of our viewers asks, what can be done about Fox News? This gets to that sort of third part that you wanted to talk about, the 10 feet tall. Um, what can be done about Fox News, which has been promulgating a false reality through a, a fire hose of disinformation for decades? So uh, is there something to be done? And if so, what is it within the sort of framework of the constitution of knowledge? Well, there's all kinds of things to be done. That's um... I'm going to I'm going to generalize the question beyond just Fox News. Fox News, you know, it's it's a mixture because the late night host lineup can go in for some really uh, extraordinary disinformation campaigns like Hannity's campaign on, on Seth Rich, a uh, false conspiracy theory. But other people there, Chris mm-hmm. Wallace, are very good and they called Arizona right. So it's a mix. Uh, the media environment is always a mix. So I'm going to generalize the question and say to what sorts of things work? When you're, when you're in an environment where you've got a lot of disinformation, a lot of canceling going on, remember, we should think about this as an environmental problem. It's like, you know, the kids are getting dumber. They're not doing as well in school. Um, their attention spans are getting shorter. You can sit around thinking, well, what are we doing wrong as parents? How do we improve the curricula? But check the water first, because if there's lead in the water, you've got an environmental problem. Same thing is true here. So how do we clean up the environment? First, you get more resilient. That means individuals need to get savvier about the fact that we're being targeted now by very effective, sophisticated weapons of epistemic warfare. Um, It's harder, not impossible, but it's harder to manipulate a population that knows that it's being manipulated. These are still powerful tools either way. Uh, And we're seeing some of that. Uh, People are more aware of that now, and they're getting more sophisticated about things like what they retweet. You need a a media that's smarter about debunking stuff without repeating it, about checking the provenance of stuff before it circulates, about covering disinformation as part of the news. Media is getting better at that. You need watchdog groups that will alert the public and especially social media and on occasion governments when they spot the germination of a conspiracy theory that's about to go viral or a disinformation campaign. And we've seen that places like the Stanford Internet Observatory right there on your campus. There are now dozens of those places in countries around the world that are helping keep us informed and understanding what we're we're going to get hit with. Um, You redesign social media platforms. You also change their policies, but I think people debate too much about who who goes on, who who stays, who goes, content moderation. That's important, but more important is redesigning these systems so they're more epistemically robust. Because right now they're encouraging us to immediately say retweet Uh, an outrageous statement or a conspiracy theory. Well, Twitter started putting up a warning screen before you do that, saying, do you want to read the link before you retweet it? Stuff like that, behavioral intervention sounds small, but in the constitution of knowledge, those add up to the incentives that make Bruce Cain, for example, think twice before he lards his academic journals with insults. There are a lot of disincentives, a lot of stopping points that will prevent him from doing that. Um, liberals are starting to organize progressives. That's a big deal against cancel culture. You need counter organization. Cause remember the key here is that numerical majorities can dominate the debate by intimidating disorganized majorities. When the majority start counter organizing and forming groups and pushing back, that changes the power equation. We're starting to see that we're seeing many new groups that are advocating, um, different kinds of free speech, putting, pushing back against cancel culture. Things like Counterweight, which is helping employees who are targeted, Academic Freedom Alliance out of Princeton, uh, Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. And there are more coming by the day. And especially important progressives who are now something that was not true three or four years ago. Progressives now realize that they are equally targeted as conservatives by disinformation. So they're joining the fight 
And that could be a game changer. Uh, civil society is mobilizing. That's like uh, Braver Angels, a group that I work with, which is a national grassroots depolarizing movement. We don't have to be slaves of these media and depolarization. We can take community level action to begin to repair some of the social bridges that help um, help guide us against polarization and, and toward truth. And it turns out that that's starting to work. So I'm not saying any of this is inevitable. I'm just saying that if we start doing these and many other things across society, it's a whole society effort, not just one or two things, then I think we win and they lose. But we got to do those things. Sorry about the long answer, Bruce, but... Oh, I, I, I'm sure the viewers appreciated that. So uh, another question that comes up comes, brings us back to the role of universities and uh, asks whether in some way uh, disinformation from academia, maybe from research, uh, is somehow uh, responsible for the proliferation of cancel culture. And so uh, I guess let's try to unpack a little bit about why you think universities have taken this turn uh, in terms of, you know, if you like policing speech rather than promoting speech. What, what's your take on all that? Well, uh, thanks for raising it. I'd actually be interested in your take if we have a minute to, to hear it because I'm not an academic creature. I'm a journalist by training and by disposition, but I sure have read a lot of the evidence and talked to a lot of the people the case of, academ of academia is very different from, say, Steve Bannon. I don't think we are seeing massive intentional disinformation and propaganda campaigns pouring out from academia in an effort to make the public cynical, divided, demoralized, um, and so forth. I think what we have seen, especially in some disciplines in the social sciences and humanities, is a decline in viewpoint diversity. And that has direct and indirect political effects, and also scientific effects. So we're incapable of seeing our own biases. This is well proven. How do we find mistakes as a society? Well, we look for other people's biases. Other people look for our biases. That's how we correct errors. And we have to let that happen. Constitution of knowledge, like the US Constitution, only works where you have diversity. Otherwise, one point of view will take over, it'll go unquestioned, it'll become a dogma, and you, will see, uh, you won't see knowledge advance. In academia, in a bunch of fields, and certainly on some campuses and some departments, you're now seeing disciplines where there are basically no conservatives, or so few as to make no difference. And recent studies uh, are looking at out and out discrimination, viewpoint discrimination in academia, and they're finding that too. Interestingly, they're finding that conservatives are just as willing to discriminate against progressives as progressives are against conservatives. It's just conservatives don't have the opportunity because there aren't enough of them to do the discriminating. But one result of that is it makes it very easy for activists with a certain point of view to essentially run rampant, to control the conversation, um, because there aren't enough people around who can call that into question. And another problem is the scientific problem. Too many questions don't get asked. Too many easy, lazy assumptions get made when you don't have real viewpoint diversity. That's the problem with, for example, making it um, a hazardous condition at a university for a professor to talk in a class about evidence that maybe police are not discriminating on basis of color. Maybe it's other kinds of discrimination, other kinds of, of problems. Um, at uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, an editor was fired, not for something that he said, but just because someone else on a JAMA podcast suggested that race was not the leading factor, disadvantaging people of color, that it was socioeconomic. He's fired for that. Well, when that's going on, when there's not enough viewpoint diversity to sustain a debate, academic work will become distorted and slanted, and we will lose knowledge. The good news is that there is a growing movement led by Heterodox Academy, Jonathan Haidt, an inspiration for this book, and now an increasing number of other people in academia who are becoming aware of this problem um, and who are starting to put their heads together and try to figure out if it can be fixed. It's not an easy problem to solve because, as you know, Bruce, right now there are not a ton of conservatives in the academic pipeline in the social sciences. But if we put our minds to it, if we realize it's a problem, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think this is addressable or do you think my diagnosis is, is even right? Um, no, your diagnosis uh, has a lot of elements of truth. I mean, 
Certainly, I agree with you that particularly, say, in law schools and the humanities, <laughs> they, there's actual papers that show uh, the law school data is actually, Adam Bodica at Stanford has actually analyzed the campaign contributions from uh, law school faculty, and it is overwhelmingly uh, democratic and liberal. So, and certainly uh, many of the humanities are also that way. A little less so, I would say, with uh, economics and uh, engineering and some other fields or business, for example. So I think sometimes the picture of the university is being uniformly liberal is uh, a little overdrawn. Let's remember Stanford, which is a pretty damn liberal place in terms of the student body, has the Hoover Institution, okay? Uh, and uh, we have, as a faculty, affirmed the right of the Hoover Institution to remain part of Stanford University. But it is, it is something that a lot of us on the faculty worry about, which is getting students to think for themselves. There is something that you're on to, I think, Jonathan, about the, the degree to which their social media habits, the homogeneity of the people that show up, particularly in the elite campuses as opposed to the public campuses, create a kind of real pressure to go along uh, in order to get along. And that's always there in that age group. I mean, you and I, when we were in college, remember that that was going on, but it seems, I think, in many ways to be reinforced. And I think a lot of faculty believe that it's very important to uh, to push back against that and to challenge. But you're right. Uh, if you if your salary depends upon the fact that the student evaluations on courses are positive, you're going to be less likely to push. And so I do worry a lot about the kind of U.S. News and World Report uh, ranking of schools, so the schools have to compete for the best students. Uh, on, in terms of numerical indicators, I do worry about the fact that faculty evaluations from the students are, are put into whether you get promoted or tenure, because I think that does make people hesitate, want to be popular with the students. And I think that does mean that you abdicate your responsibility to challenge them. But that said, I mean, there's a deeper question that I want to get to, which is what's the role of a university in this spectrum uh, that includes the kinds of places like Brookings and the AEI and then, you know, the, the actual elected officials. I mean, to what degree, I think a lot of my colleagues want to get into the business of actually advocating for solutions. And once you do that, I think you necessarily have to bring in value as well as fact. And so I, I, I wonder whether some of our problems with respect to people doubting the science of climate change has to do with the fact that uh, if, if you're a judge, you have to appear to be neutral. If you're somebody providing the facts, maybe you have to go out of your way to let your value judgments be in the background or to act more neutrally. Um, you know, some of the problems we've had with climate change has to do with the fact that people, some of the scientists were caught thinking about um, climate change politics, right? They were, there was a discussion going on with some British academics about it. And so it became unclear as to whether they were acting as scientists or as political actors. So, I mean, I think that the, what, what, do you see a kind of a more cabined role for academic research that it should stay out of uh, the engagement of issues? Or do you think that we should be engaged more? Because that's a big issue right now on a lot of campuses. Are we doing too little or too much? Well, as, as you probably know, Bruce, um, American academia arises from long from from decades before there were research universities. Our colleges were there to train ministers and farmers um, to teach them the classics, to make them better citizens and to teach values, really. So and universities have always been hotbeds of activism, social activism, too. So both of these things are part of their role. And I'm OK with that. But the condition there is a condition that, that you alluded to. Don't compromise on rigor. Don't compromise on checking for error. Don't let your politics interfere with the constitution of knowledge. Our first political commitment, and it is a political commitment, it is a values commitment, is to the rules that say things like no truthiness in science, in journalism, in law, in government. The fact that you think something should be true or that maybe it's part of a narrative that's kind of, kind of you think might be true, that's not good enough. When you get into the realm of, of knowledge, there's some rules you need to apply. And those rules include saying, you know what? 
this is what I think, but I'm not sure. Here's the best evidence. What do you think? If we do that, then I think we can do a pretty good job of not getting too politicized. Um, sure, I accept that, that values and facts always commingle and, and they always should. And the case I'm making in my book is ultimately a case for values because the claim I'm making about the Constitution of Knowledge rests on my argument that it is better at producing freedom, knowledge, and above all, peace by far than any other social system for deciding what's true and what's false. But to be convincing, people have to agree with me that freedom, knowledge, and peace are good things. So yeah, um, a, a very specific application of the point you're making, Bruce, is a lot of journalists, including me, are more and more uneasy with the crossover into opinion in the news pages, in particular with the use of social media by reporters to express opinions. And I know a lot of editors, a lot of publications that would put a stop to that if they thought they could. Right now, they think they can't, but people are becoming more aware of this problem. Uh, we lose the public's trust in the reality-based community if we either are politicized or if we're seen as politicized. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because when I was growing up, it seemed to me that we went to the newspapers to actually get what happened. Now, because of social media, you know, we already know what's happened when we wake up in the morning and read the newspapers, which then pushes the media necessarily into interpretation. So it, it does seem like, once again, uh, a kind of underlying change in the way we get information is uh, part of this, the 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 sort of velocity problem that you talk about in the book, that that information gets out there so fast, maybe in, a, in, a, in advance of our uh you know, our ability to judge it. So let, I mean, we only have, uh, we're getting towards the end. So I want to come back to uh, you, the suggestions you make and the question of whether you have optimism or uh, about where we are. Are we, I mean, I, I, at this particular point in time, there, with, there, we still have the disinformation on uh, the January 6th insurrection. Uh, the, re the Republicans refused to go along with the plan to have an independent commission. And so now the Democrats are going forward with a select committee. Nancy Pelosi has said that they were going to discover the truth. Is trying to find that truth through a select committee within, uh, you know, is that likely to make any progress in getting us to understand the truth or well, what do you do when you can't have, I mean, the, 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 your constitution of knowledge would prefer the independent commission, I'm assuming, not sure. a, the democratic controlled select committee. So what do you do when you can't have the, con, the right conditions of objective? Do, do you do nothing or do you go ahead with something which is uh, itself somewhat tainted by the suspicion of a partisanship? Well, the big answer to that question society-wide is you rebuilt in all the ways that I mentioned. Uh, yeah. The specific answer in terms of that commission is you show your work. You just be extra rigorous and extra careful to document every claim that you make. And you go out of your way to include dissenting views. And you put that down there, too. But you go into it knowing that because it's Nancy Pelosi's select committee, that a lot of Americans are simply going to reject it out of hand. And other Americans who might not reject it will think its conclusions might or might not be true when, in fact, its conclusions are just plain true. Uh, a disinformation warfare campaign will be waged against that report, regardless of what it says. Um, and so this is why I call this an environmental problem earlier. Anything you introduce into a corrupt environment becomes corrupted. It corrodes. If you introduce it to an oxygen, you know, if it's metal and you, you leave it outside in the rain. Same thing is true here. And that's why I keep emphasizing the answers to the specific problems are to begin fighting back on all these multiple fronts. So you asked, am I optimistic? I tell people I'm hopeful. Uh, it's too early to be optimistic because these tactics that we're talking about now, uh, disinformation, trolling, canceling, conspiracy bootstrapping, they are in control of a major political party at the moment. It is now established that that party can, can and will continue to do those things, even if Donald Trump loses the presidency in his Twitter account. Cancelers are still pretty much running rampant. Um, and we're in the same position that a naive, an epidemiologically naive 
population, meaning a not previously exposed population, is when it hits a new virus. It just seems to run rampant through the population. Will we develop enough resilience, enough immunity, enough resistance fast enough to get back on our feet, reestablish some public norms for truth, um, rebuild trust and rebuild buy-in? I don't honestly know the answer to that, Bruce, but I do know one thing for sure, which is if we sit on our rear ends thinking, well, it'll all sort itself out, the marketplace of ideas will find, uh, is we'll, we'll do the job and cancel culture will subside because people will get bored with it. Uh-uh, that's not enough. So I, 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 I agree with a lot of what you said. Uh, one question I would have, though, is the context of politics right now where we have two closely divided parties, right, where winning is really at stake and the polarization has been going on for 20 years. We have rising inequality. We have challenges presented by immigration. Um, how do we sort out in terms of what we're doing to sort of, you know, make the discussion more rational, how much of it should be actually addressing some of these underlying problems of people that used to be able to have union jobs, not having union jobs, people being threatened by cultural change. I mean, how much time do we spend on the way we communicate with one another and how much is it really addressing some of these underlying problems in your view? I think we all do as much as we can, wherever we can be most constructive. It's just that simple. The problems you mentioned do feed into each other. One of the products of propaganda, maybe the most important, is polarization. This is what Vladimir Putin does. He determines where the dividing lines, where the schisms, the fractures are in American society, and then uses propaganda to amplify them. That's why during 2016, Russian trolls were able to stimulate opposing protests on both sides of the street in several American cities, uh, thereby making demonstrations of how weak and divided our society is. And polarization, in turn, returns the compliment because it makes it lays the groundwork for propaganda. A polarized society is more willing to think the worst of the other side, to believe conspiracy theories, to disbelieve yeah. facts. So these things all feed each other, and that makes it all sound insurmountable. I would just remind people that we have surmounted challenges, crises of these in the past. Uh, not with ease, the Civil War, that, that was, we don't want that again. Uh, but there's a lot we can do. And, and the point is to get started doing what we, what we as an individual and what our institutions, Stanford, Brookings, wherever we work, what we can do. And just start and go and, and not forget that over time, the constitution of knowledge has been society's best performing institution. It has revolized, rev sorry, it has revolutionized our capacity as a species to have peace and freedom and knowledge. And we still got those principles on our side if we mobilize. So one last question from the audience, which is, uh, you know, is there any role or important role here for intellectual humility and genuine willingness to persuade, <laughs> to be persuaded? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a softball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, that's, the, that's the spirit of learning. Um, and that doesn't mean we should go into every conversation without having strong opinions. Strong opinions are the, the lifeblood of the Constitution of knowledge. You want people to take strong opinions and defend them vigorously. Um, that's, that's how we get the, the passion that is needed to surmount all the many difficulties and expenses of building knowledge. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, if you lose an election, you have to be willing to move on to the next election. If you lose the argument, you need to be willing to say, okay, maybe I was wrong that time. I'm still not sure I was wrong, but let me see how else I can contribute constructively to the debate. Yeah. Sometimes easier said than done. <laughs> Always. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think, um, you know, our time is uh, coming up to uh, the end here. And so I want to thank Jonathan for joining us uh, today's Commonwealth Club program. And I Bruce, I want to thank to... you. I can't, <laughs> well, I can't imagine too. a better interlocutor. And I've learned so much from your political science over the years. Oh. I hope I can repay a little bit of that in this, you, this thinking. You did very much. Uh, I really enjoyed reading the book. And I want to encourage all of viewers to purchase the new book. Again, it's called The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth. Uh, and uh, you can buy it wherever. I think almost all bookstores are probably carrying it. Um, and uh, this program will be placed on the Commonwealth Club website, uh, at, which you can find at commonwealthclub.org. And we encourage you to view it and share it. I'm Bruce Kane, and this is the Commonwealth Club program is now adjourned. 
So thank you very much. And thank you, Jonathan.